Welcome to today's webinar, Measuring Up to Poverty Reduction in Rural BC. My name is Natasha Payne. I'm a community animator for Vibrant Communities Canada. Here today with Nadine Reynolds, Jan Morton, Jill Zacharias, Carrie Wall, and Anna Purcell. Before we be begin today's call, I'd like to start by introducing our speakers. Uh, so Nadine is the executive, uh, sorry, Nadine works for the Columbia Basin Rural Development Institute at Selkirk College, researching social and cultural indicators of well-being and assisting communities with the Columbia Basin boundary region and data indicators to support poverty reduction efforts. She has nearly 20 years of experience working with environmental and social change organizations from small community groups to national nonprofits. Welcome, Nadine. Uh, we also have Jan with us today. Jan is the Executive Director of the Greater Trail Community Skills Centre and is facilitating a process to develop a poverty reduction plan with key stakeholders in the Lower Columbia region. Jan will bring to the session more than 40 years experience in adult education, employment services, organizational leadership, and community economic development. We'd also like to mention and celebrate that just a couple of days ago, Jan was appointed to the BC Minister's Advisory Forum on Poverty Reduction, um, along with about 30 other individuals from around the province. So welcome, Jan, and congratulations. Thank you. Uh, we also have Jill, who is the Social Development Coordinator for the City of Revelstoke and has been facilitating work on poverty reduction since poverty reduction since 2011, um, including the development and implementation of the community-based strategy. Jill has represented Poverty Reduction Network in rural areas and at workshops in Nelson, Ottawa during the City's Reducing Poverty National Summit in 2015 in Whistler and is currently the co-chair of Tamarack's BC-wide Poverty Reduction Community of Practice. Welcome, Jill. Uh, we also have Carrie, who is a community health facilitator with Interior Health, working on healthy public policy and local governments throughout the Kootenai and Boundary regions of the province. Carrie is a listed member of both Family Mediation Canada and International Association of Facilitators. She does freelance mediation, conflict coaching, parent education, and group facilitation on the side, and has been working closely with the Cranbrook Poverty Reduction Committee since its inception. Welcome, Carrie. And then finally, we have Anna, who is a Purcell from Purcell's Cove, Nova Scotia, and made her way to Nelson, BC in 20, 2008 by way of Halifax, Toronto, Vancouver, Victoria Island, and Gabriola Island. A resourceful Jill of several trades, she has supported herself as an artist, owned and operated her own book distribution business, developed ESL curriculum, and worked as a volunteer coordinator for a busy community-run theater. She's currently enjoying her first term on Nelson City Council, where her portfolio spans economic, social, and cultural sectors. Uh, when she's not... When she's not championing inclusion and equity, she can be found wandering Nelson's picturesque alleys with her sketch pad, puttering in her garden, or baking pies. <laughs> I welcome everyone, Nadine, Jan, Jill, Carrie, Anna, thank you for joining today's broadcast. Um, I will hop back on a little bit later, but Nadine, I'm going to turn it over to you first um, to introduce us to this uh, BC initiative. Great. Thank you, Natasha. So we wanted to start by just giving you a little bit of an orientation to the Columbia Basin. Not sure how many people are from the basin on the webinar, but the Columbia Basin encompasses about 8.6 million hectares of land in the southeastern portion of British Columbia. So you can see the, the map of BC and then the blowout of the basin. There's about 167,000 people who live in this region with 28 municipalities, uh, three regional districts in full, and a portion of two other uh, regional districts. So it's definitely rural. It's very rural. The largest center is where Cary is from, Cranbrook, and there's just, um, just over 20,000 people there. Next is Nelson, the next busy, busy, um, biggest at 10,500 people. I live just north of Silverton. I'm not sure how well you can see all these communities, but that's our smallest municipality. That's 195 people. And we collectively identify um, with the Columbia Basin because it's the area that the Columbia Basin Trust serves. And the, the trust was created in 1995 to support the efforts of people in the basin and really to create a legacy of social, economic, and environmental well-being in the Canadian portion of the Columbia River system, um, which is the most affected by the Columbia River Treaty. So I'm not going to go into 
um, details on that, but if you're more interested in that history, please um, look up the, the Columbia River Treaty or the Columbia Basin Trust. Next slide, please. So all of the members, um, all of us here today, are part of the Columbia Basin Poverty Reduction Working Group. And really this is, this is a semi-formal group that came together initially through the coordination of the Columbia Basin Trust uh, with a purpose of sharing knowledge, sharing experience, staying connected across this large region because there are many groups doing different things and, and being networked and sharing those learnings is really important. Uh, the Rural Development Institute, who I work with, uh, joined the group to help collate data to um, help provide indicators related to poverty and then to also help identify measures for gauging the impact of poverty reduction efforts over time. So as this group together, we've been doing research together, sharing lessons learned, um, and the group is as a regional community part of the Vibrant Communities Network. Next slide. So but as an introduction too, I wanted to just give a bit of an overview of why we do this work and, and what the data tells us about poverty in the Columbia Basin. Um, but preface it though with a note that measuring poverty is not easy. Um, it's a complex issue as many of you likely know and it has impacts across all sectors of our communities and our society. There's no official government definition of poverty and there's generally no agreed upon provincially supported set of indicators. So this isn't an easy task. However, fortunately there has been work done in this, is in this area and um, you know, RDI has been reviewing and, and analyzing and basically working with the data that is available. And so understanding these measures, looking at the data can help inform the poverty, work, poverty reduction work that's being done in our communities. Next slide. To give you a sense of how we begin to measure poverty, I just wanted to share a few of these indicators that we've been exploring at the RDI and uh, with our community partners. And one of the main themes, as you probably can guess, is income. And so we can look at, we can get access to average income data of individuals, of different family types. We can also look at source of income, um, unemployment rates, but really one of the more telling indicators and that's often used in measuring poverty is the low income measure, which is a relative measure um, and shows us essentially those living below the poverty line. And so in our region, we know that 10 communities, and actually these are all in the West Kootenai, sort of the Southwest portion of, our, of the basin, have above provincial average of people living below the poverty line. And this really hasn't changed um, in the last five years. <clears throat> Next slide. <clears throat> when we look at the different family units, um, we, we see that the lone parent families are the worst off. And you can see here with up to 40% of these families living in income poverty. And again, higher than the, higher than the average um, compared to the province. So what you're seeing here are the three main regional districts and for British Columbia over again over the last five years. <clears throat> Next slide. So another important measure, another indicator um, is around housing affordability. And it's commonly agreed that when more than 30% of a household's income is spent on shelter expenses, the housing is considered unaffordable. And so we have uh, data on this and it's um, called core housing need. And so in the Columbia Basin, right across the region on average, we know that 17% of owner households and 36% of tenant households are in core housing need. They are spending more than 30% of their income on their shelter expenses. Those that spend 50% or more are, are deemed to be severe housing need um, and we actually do have a few communities in particular in our region who are where we have people spending 50 to 60 percent of their income just on their shelter. We also do look at uh, vacancy rates and that is another important indicator of housing security and we get that data from the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation and so we know that nine communities in the basin um, have very low vacancy rates the, the balanced rate is considered to be about 3%. Nelson, for example, in 2016, 
Revelstoke, 0.4%. Cranbrook, 1.7% vacancy. So these are very, very low vacancy rates. It's, it's hard to find um, affordable housing. It's hard to find housing at all in these communities. Next slide. So income security, food, uh, income security, housing security, and food security. This is the sort of third main theme. Um, unfortunately, we have limited data, regional data for, for food security. We have gotten some data through the hunger count, which is done by Food Banks Canada. Um, and we had 16 food banks across the basin report last year. We do know that this is an underestimation because we had a, a, a study done actually commissioned by the Columbia Basin Trust in 2012. We know that there are at least 19 food banks. Um, and I think in our conversations, again, sharing that knowledge, um, I think there are actually many, many more out there that, that we don't know about and who aren't reporting. So. This is an underestimation, but what we know from this data is that 30% of those who are using the food bank are children. 44% are women, 57% are single, and the majority are renting. And so we, we do get into some more in-depth data on this, um, and at each of the communities I know have, each of the women here have been working with food banks um, at the community level to get better access to uh, reliable data. So these are just a few of the indicators under those three main themes. Um, if you're interested in more of the indicator work that we've done, I've put our website link there, Columbia Basin Rural Development Institute, cbrdi.ca, and we have a number of um, reports and also access to, to data if you're interested in any of these specifics. So that's sort of the overview I wanted to provide before um, kind of diving into each of the the, the communities here and um, what we want to explore are, are these indicators in action you know using this data measuring measuring and then taking action um, based on that new understanding and so we're first going to go to the lower Columbia where Jan is and next slide so the Lower Columbia is a sub-region consisting of five different municipalities and two rural electoral districts. There are about 20,000 people in this region um, with, and you can see the, the, basically this is down in the south, again, further southwest portion. It's right on, right on the U.S. Um, border. It takes about 40 minutes to drive from one end of the region to the other. And there are some significant employers here. We've got a, a lead zinc smelter, a regional hospital, as well as the related services, and a ski hill, a pretty Red Mountain Resort, if anyone's uh, been there. It's now snowing up there. Um, and of course, a lot of other recreation and tourism operators connected to that. And so while there is access to well-paying jobs and careers, there are still a significant number of people who are living in poverty. So Jan, how long has, has your community in the Lower Columbia been involved in, in this in sort of intentional poverty reduction planning? Well, it started in 2012, and maybe we could go to the next slide to, to move this forward. In, in a formal sense, it started in 2012 when we secured the first of two uh, status of women funded projects, the first one called Women Creating Change. It's more intentionally over the last couple of years become, become a more comprehensive and inclusive process of poverty reduction planning. Great. Okay. And how has how has that the data contributed to this process? Well, we've used both quantitative and qualitative data, and we've used it to identify or really can often to confirm hunches about need, to inform planning conversations and to engage stakeholders and political support. What we haven't yet uh, done is to use data to measure progress and to be perfectly honest I'm not sure we have the right data um, to be using in order to to figure out process or uh, progress but um, in terms of looking at what some of that data is is that um, guided by the format traditional format of the status of women projects with our first project, Women Creating Change, we started with baseline research, in this case with a report that we call the Economic Opportunity for the Lower Columbia Region, and it's a gender-based analysis of that economic opportunity. 
It contained a lot of hard statistical data as well as qualitative, qualitative interview data and focus group um, data. And the research also included first time calculation of the living wage for our region. And so kind of in an iterative process with the researchers between the researchers and the project's management and advisory teams, we used that data to create a plan called the 2020 vision for, uh, for women in 2020. Um, and I'm just, there's lots of data in the report, but a few of the pieces of data that really jumped up, first of all, was the wage gap between men and women, um, where um, if you look at, at the balance is um, fewer than 50% uh, of women, um, or actually more than 50% of women earn less than 24,000 a year as opposed to the 50,000 K and you see the gap at the 50,000 K between men and women where men are at 43% of men earn more than 50,000 a year and 16% of women hit that, that benchmark. Next slide please. Next slide. Um, other key patterns was certainly uh, the concentration of women in traditional what we consider traditional employment, retail, health, social services, and also reflecting back to Nadine's comments about uh, low-income families, that for every low-income family uh, led by a man, three of them are led by women. So if you put it together with where women are located on the income scale and where they're located in the labor market, then you start to have some pattern as to you know, how we, how we uh, focused our efforts. Um, if you could then go to the next slide. So in that particular project, we then proceeded to focus on initiatives um, that were connected with improving access to education and supporting the recruitment of retention, recruitment and retention of women into higher paid male dominated areas of work. And concurrently, we mounted a campaign to manage the support of key stakeholders in the region using a presentation that included certainly the hard data as well as a photo voice video through a pretty compelling set of voices of low-income women um, speaking their perspective on what it is to live in poverty. Next slide. So this particular work led us to the second Status of Women funded project called Mining and Refining for Women in which we worked in close uh, partnership with that uh, smelter that you mentioned, Nadine, Tech Metals Limited, to develop a mentorship program to support the retention and advancement of women in the non-traditional employment areas. Recognizing that by affecting advancement or retention and advancement, eventually we would affect recruitment as well as recruitment into the suppliers, industrial suppliers to tech. So again, we started with baseline research, and in this case, it was an online questionnaire distributed to the entire tech trail operations of about 1,500 employees. Over the span of a week, we got um, more than a 20% response rate to that questionnaire, which is pretty extraordinary, very male-dominated uh, plant, and yet more than a 20% response rate, giving perspectives on men and women in the workplace. And the data from that questionnaire ended up, we manipulated it, analyzed it, looked at it from multiple perspectives, and it really informed the design of the work that we ended up doing. And we also then brought in key tra uh, trends from Women Creating Change, um, which helped the participants um, who work for the plant to recognize the value of the project, not just for themselves internally within the company, but in the context with the community as a whole. Um, and then I will say that there were times that sometimes there's just unexpected data. So in the middle of one of the advisory committee meetings, um, one of the senior members of the HR department kind of offhandedly said, oh, by the way, you know, there's been some change in, in the recruitment patterns of women. Between uh, 2013 and, and 2016, the percentage of female permanent new hires increased from 12.5% to 20%, and that's in a two-and-a-half-year period whoa, now we're starting to move towards a tipping point and a cultural change in the community. Next slide, please. 
Next slide. Yeah, and that's really when we started to move into looking at poverty reduction from a more comprehensive place. People were saying it's great that you're looking at it from a gender perspective, don't lose that, but also make sure that everybody is included in looking at um, poverty reduction. And so we started actually just collecting data, and that's where we really tied into our work with RDI, developing this particular report, Surviving Not Thriving, um, poverty reduction in the lower Columbia region and um, we also used a lot of this data to engage stakeholder support or in in a planning session next slide please and next slide and uh, that planning session actually took place in May it was over a two-day process using an appreciative inquiry approach 70 stakeholders from a real variety of perspectives engaged in a pretty intense planning process. And out of that, we've identified the pillars that sit in front of you on the slides, housing, food security, vibrant economy and income, learning and development, and health, social and community services. Um, we are just about to launch that um, plan officially, beginning of, of uh, December, and we'll then be moving into, well, I can't say we're moving into action, we're already moving into action, mm -hmm. but in a more formal way with the launch, we will be moving forward to implement the plan. And thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Jen, and thanks for that overview, and it's neat to see the, the evolution of the different projects that you've been working on. So we're going to head a little little to the east now, over mm -hmm. to the city of Nelson. And yes. Anna, we wanted to ask you a little bit about those initiatives. Um, so much of the work that's been done at, at Nelson at its best has kind of focused on housing and homelessness. And, and I know you guys have been doing a homelessness a report card for about nine years now. And so could you tell us a bit about this focus on housing security, um, housing issues as an element of your poverty reduction work? Sure, yes, um, uh, absolutely. As you mentioned, Nadine, uh, Nelson's a town of about 10,000 people. Our population is stayed more or less stable. We, uh, we also have about 15,000 people sprinkled around us who come into town regularly to use services, shop, work, and enjoy themselves. Um, and so we've always been a beautiful, desirable place to live and have almost always had housing affordability and availability issues. You can go back more than 50 years uh, and look at our local newspaper articles and find uh, articles on our housing crisis. Um, and 100 years ago, we were full of hotels that uh, were housing for miners and loggers. And the second most common business license type at the time was for rooming houses. Whatever happened to rooming houses? I don't know. Um, we, we need to bring them back. But so over the years, there have been a number of different entities that have tackled housing, uh, each having their own impact. And then in 2001, the Nelson Committee on Homelessness, or ENCO for short, was formed in response to the federal government's National Housing Initiative. The initiative required that there was a demonstrated need in the community for housing, which we clearly had, uh, and that there was a community advisory board, which ENCO became by organizing the previous providers and interested citizens. And so because there was a vocal and organized group already in place and political will in the form of our MP at the time, uh, Nelson became one of 61 communities in Canada that was designated with a serious homelessness problem and by far the smallest community. Uh, the next largest was Kelowna at more than 100,000 people. So um, we, we found ourselves in a remarkable position to get this federal funding. And um, the program under which ENCO continues to receive federal funding Funding has changed names a few times over the years, but the requirements have stayed more or less the same. ENCO has to review data and, and information, set priorities, uh, create a community plan using um, you know, um, feedback from the community at large and continue to revise that plan. Uh, they review local proposals and make recommendations to Service Canada and coordinate um, efforts on the ground in Nelson around homelessness. Um, and so by working with other agencies and acquiring one-time grants and multi-year funding, um, ENCO successfully supported the creation of a number of really important initiatives in Nelson, all of which continue today uh, and have become self-sustaining in that they now get their funding from somewhere else. So some of those projects include our only homeless shelter uh, called Stepping Stones, the creation of Ward Street Place, which is a really interesting social enterprise with um, commercial activity at street level, supporting 45 um, below market 
affordable units um, upstairs and downstairs. Um, the installation of showers and laundry services of the Salvation Army, the creation of our food bank, of our soup kitchen, youth outreach workers, transitional support workers, adult support recovery beds, the street culture collaborative outreach workers have all um, been seeded by ENCO money and have um, gone on to have a life of their own. Um, ENCO also did Nelson's first point in time homelessness count in 2016 and is planning another one in 2018 and also carried out two major research projects, one more on homelessness in a rural context in general and one focusing on um, understanding youth homelessness and housing issues in our broader region and they also put on three events uh, every year. There's the annual report card that identifies issues in local need and, and that's as you mentioned it's been nine years running and then there's homelessness action week which happens annually every October since I think 20, 2005 uh, that helps engage the community and increase awareness of homelessness issues with panel presentations and films and luncheons and things. And, um, and then there's Community Connect Days, which was initiated in 2008 and is essentially a marketplace of free activities and resources for people who are struggling to make ends meet. So there are things like dental services, haircuts, massages, child minding, uh, free clothing boutique, health testing, free food. It's a lot of fun. Um, and I guess if you ask any of the people on ENCO about their success, they will say it's com totally dependent on a really well-documented need to address homelessness, ongoing funding, obviously, having someone in a coordinator position to ensure that events and programs are consistently carried out, um, and being a really broadly inclusive um, uh, committee. So it includes uh, service providers and faith groups, um, lived experience participants when we can get them, uh, interested volunteers and representatives from all levels of government. But most of all they stress the importance that that cannot be overstated, the value of the willingness of all participants to collaborate over the long haul. It, it's um, we have a real heart for collaboration in Nelson. There are a number of different collaborative bodies addressing uh, a myriad of different um, issues, but especially in the social sector. Um, and it's so important because it is a long haul. And despite ENCO's uh, clear successes, um, housing affordability and availability remain top community concerns and, mm -hmm. and improvements are often incremental and the need can feel relentless. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. And I'm just always amazed every time with how much is going on in these small communities. You know, this is a community of 10,000 people and uh, and there are a lot of people who volunteer their time and contribute to all those initiatives you've mentioned. So thanks for describing that and, and also that history. Um, and Carrie, I, I wanted to, we wanted to ask you, you know, in, in Cranbrook, there also has been some focus on housing security and, and I know in your region, um, in particular in the basin, there's there's a considerable First Nations presence with the, the Tunaha Nation and I'm wondering if you could tell us about the poverty work, uh, reduction work happening in Cranbrook and area. <laughs> Thanks so much Nadine. Yeah, there is a real presence of the Tunaha. Uh, they are a First Nation that is, well, in the East Kootenai a lot, like down in the southeastern portion of the province and also down across the border into the state. Near Cranbrook, we have four Indian reservations that the Tunaha claim as, you know, is Tunaha land. Um, there's the Akam Reserve just outside Cranbrook, the Yakinuki, which is near Creston, the Akiskinuk Reserve, which is near uh, Invermere, and then there's another one, it's the Tobacco Plains Indian Reserve, and I think it's called Akinkum Askinkit, but I might have my pronunciation <laughs> off there. <laughs> And, and so also since Cranbrook is located, as you said earlier, Nadine, in a very uh, uh, the hub, and people come to Cranbrook for services. It's got the regional hospital, and outside of Cranbrook, it, it, its population is quite sparse. So people come to Cranbrook when they have need, and uh, there is a real presence of a street culture, um, like there would be really in any really urban setting, and again, of course, of the Tunaha. In my role as a community health facilitator for Interior Health, I'm a member of the Cranbrook Social Planning Society and the Cranbrook Poverty Reduction Committee. Most recently, we've been doing focused poverty reduction work in Cranbrook since about 2012. There were iterations of the work before that, of course, 
including a calculation of a living wage for Cranbrook almost 10 years ago. However, governments change and folks in the community can move on from their jobs and their organizations. So it seems to me that this work needs to constantly renew itself and key players need to stay involved long enough to carry momentum. I would say one challenge we've experienced in Cranbrook is related to this idea of keeping key players involved and collaborating so that the work can deepen and move forward. In Cranbrook, poverty reduction work is still it's quite siloed and the groups here and there are tackling small pieces of the work, yet we don't have anyone in a paid and dedicated position to coordinate efforts or take on larger or more upstream projects for the most part. Before the last local government election in 2014, Cranbrook City Council was really interested in poverty reduction and they, and they partnered with a couple of provincial organizations to prioritize it. Then three years ago, the mayor and all six city councils were replaced. And at social planning and the poverty reduction committee, we felt like we had to start from scratch again to build alliances with the city and recreate a common understanding of poverty and other social issues. Again, about the Tanaha Nation, as you mentioned, yeah, they, they do have a very considerable presence in Cranbrook, and they operate an extensive and highly praised service program called Operation Street Angel. Operation Street Angel brings awareness to poverty issues in our community, and it's designed to assist people facing adversity by providing continued support, outreach, and community inclusion, as well as guidance and awareness of the services that are available. They offer meals, shower facilities, laundry facilities, a drop-in center, a nurse practitioner, and a lot more. In addition to Operation Street Angel and the other excellent work by the Tunaha Nation, including Child and Family Services, they have a family, a family poverty consultant, and, and more. There are service-oriented organizations with exceptional staff and programming who are serving vulnerable populations in Cranbrook, such as the Salvation Army and the Community Connection Society, plus more. It's apparent to many of us that if there is such a large sector dedicating resources to supporting people in need, then the need must be pretty substantial. However, we've faced a lot of hurdles in trying to understand the extent of poverty in Cranbrook and grapple for solutions. We know through food bank statistics meal programs, shelter data, school lunch program numbers, affordable housing inquiries, um, that poverty affects hundreds of local people, if not more. And we'd like to get a single detailed picture of the face of poverty here in our community and bring that local data together in a single report and share it with everyone. Mm -hmm. And this is the effort that really the RDI has been so helpful with. <laughs> we were pleased to get a small grant through the Columbia Basin Trust to fund some data gathering and report writing to help our community get a clear picture of the issues. And so this poverty report for Cranbrook is nearly complete. We've been very fortunate to work with the Rural Development Institute here in the Columbia Basin. And you, our other partners from the Basin communities on this call, the suite of poverty reduction indicators that you, Nadine, and your colleagues at the RDI put together is wonderful. And it will continue to be an amazing resource, enabling us to see if we're making improvements over time. To use that upstream downstream analogy that most folks on this call are probably familiar with, in Cranbrook there is a lot of important downstream work happening on poverty reduction, as I mentioned, to pull folks out of the river. And we still have a lot of strategizing to do to figure out how some of us can get upstream in collaboration with our colleagues occupied with those downstream efforts so that we can test out and apply some systemic solutions. This is likely the key challenge across the country. I, I happen to think it might be particularly acute in Cranbrook at this time. Mm. On, the, on the plus side, I've got some dedicated and hardworking <laughs> colleagues in Cranbrook who are addressing poverty reduction off the side of their desks, and we continue to meet and build trust and weave the threads together. Working with other groups like Tamarack and Vibrant Communities and the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition has helped us build capacity and envision possibilities. One massive success was the implementation of a free low-income bus program for Cranbrook residents, which makes Cranbrook a leader in addressing poverty through practical solutions. I think we might still be the only community in BC to offer free bus passes to low-income citizens, but I, I, don't, I may be wrong on that. I'll finish 
by saying that tomorrow there will be a day-long workshop in Cranbrook on affordable housing, and it's happening after many months of meetings and through the collaboration of many agencies, including the City of Cranbrook, the College of the Rockies, myself from the Poverty Reduction Committee and Interior Health, also the real estate sector and BC Housing, the social sector and others. This is the culmination of a lot of hard work to build a shared understanding of housing and homelessness in Cranbrook. And luck and good timing also played a role. <laughs> and we hope to be beginning for advancing the poverty reduction and equality agenda in our corner of the Kootenays. Great, thank you. Well, I hope that's a really good uh, event tomorrow. And thanks for describing you know, the region. I think um, for people who are in the webinar, you can see how unique <laughs> Each of these communities really is. We, you know, I think it's neat, it's great that we identify at this regional scale, and probably we have more commonalities than differences. But each community really is 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 quite unique in its its culture and obviously its challenges. Um, and it's interesting, Carrie. You know, you mentioned that the importance of that paid coordinator. And so I'd like to ask you, Jill, um, you know, you're based in Revelstoke and <clears throat> I think in many ways Revelstoke's been quite fortunate to have you in the social development coordinator role. It's a position embedded into the city of Revelstoke and, and I know this has allowed you to work collaboratively as others have mentioned at the community level as well as across the region and and the province in some of your your um, other roles so can you tell us a bit about what you've learned over the years in in being in this position in that role in your community for sure thank you so much Nadine um, sorry I'm just being distracted by massive sirens I don't know if you can hear that but <laughs> oh, no. it's really snowing right now so <laughs> that usually means they're going out to the highway as you can see, we're quite an, uh, a mountainous community and, and the highway when it's snowing is always always a bit problematic. Um, but to get back to the webinar, um, I think because municipalities have an overarching vision or role, um, that they are very well placed to provide leadership and coordination that frontline service providers simply do not have the time to do. More than anything, I've learned that having a key point person with poverty reduction embedded into their work plan has been really critical to keep the work moving forward. Many communities struggle with this very first and very necessary piece. For us, collecting measurements has been very important for a number of reasons. First, we wanted our work to be grounded in reality and not driven by anecdotal evidence. In any community, there's always lots of talk. We needed to find out what was real and what, was, and what wasn't. For many years at many different levels, no one has wanted to talk about poverty in Canada, but it's hard to dismiss or downplay work that is evidence-based. Secondly, we needed to understand the key factors that influence poverty within our community context. And third, it gave us baseline data that we could then use to target and measure the impacts of our efforts over time. And the data told us some amazing stories. As part of looking at income security, one of the things we did was conduct a local market basket analysis for the very first time. Mm -hmm. This gave us a cost of living threshold that we were then able to compare to incomes and numbers of households uh, using tax pilot data. We found that the actual number of households in Revelstoke who were at or below earning enough income to meet their basic needs was not 12% as the LICO told us, not 17% as the low income measure told us, but rather a whopping 30%. And this told me, and this in turn, told me two things. One, that there were people living in our community who were, ex who were experiencing a very deep level of poverty. And two, that poverty was impacting the very economy of our community. So I learned that in order to address poverty, we needed to work together to change the conversation in our communities. We all know about the pillars of community economic development. We know about economic and environmental sustainability. 
more and more I'm coming to realize that something as essential and systemic as poverty is not isolated to the social realm. The social sustainability of communities becomes the foundation of everything else. So it's not just the isolation of people living in poverty that needs to be addressed. It's the isolation and stigmatization of the work and the conversation itself. Mm -hmm. So the challenge has been to embed poverty reduction in community and economic development work to the point where it becomes a priority for action that goes well beyond the social sector. And community conversations take place to promote this broader understanding and engage key st stakeholders from different sectors. A really good example of this is right now, we're having a really hard time um, uh, finding enough people to work in our community. Uh, we, we actually have uh, more employment than we do workers for the first time in, in a really long time. And one of the underlying causes of that is a lack of um, availability and affordability of housing. This, with the census data that was just released, we now know that almost 43% of our renters are experiencing core housing need. And almost 19% of our home owners are experiencing core housing need. And our vacancy rate, as, as Nadine pointed out earlier, is extremely low. So bringing it into the mainstream is absolutely critical to getting ahead and making a real impact. We know that this is a prerequisite in order to set the wheels in motion for effective long-term change, because that's what we are all going for. So now I talk about poverty reduction being not only one of the most significant social development challenges of our time, but also one of the most significant economic development opportunities of our time. You imagine if 30% of your uh, residents actually had disposable <coughs> income. One of our most successful events in this regard was working with our local community futures organization to host a regional economic development forum on the economics of poverty reduction. So finally, I think the most encouraging thing that I've learned is that we really can do it. Uh, engaging with representatives within our region and around the province really does make a difference. I think it's been encouraging for other small rural communities and it has truly been amazing to see the momentum building in our region and witness the ripple effects of all our work to see major funders like the Columbia Basin Trust and the Vancouver Foundation make poverty reduction a key funding priority. And uh, you know, here in BC, the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition is a great example of how advocacy and raising awareness actually does work. Now we have a province who is really engaging in uh, developing a, a higher level poverty reduction strategy for the province of BC, which is very, very exciting. So by working together, by empowering the voice of different sectors, as well as people with lived experience, and most importantly, having a unified voice, we are changing the conversation. We are also seeing a much higher level of engagement with all levels of government. And at the end of the day, it's going to make a real difference for us all. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great, great. Thank you, Jill. And thank you, all of you, for sharing uh, these stories, for taking the time out of, I know, um, there's lots of work that you're all doing at the community level and I think it's it's neat to be able to share it um, at a national level and so it, that sort of provides an overview for everyone on the, the webinar um, of each of these communities and an overview and some details I guess you know uh, in our small communities there isn't always very um, visible poverty or visible homelessness and and that sort of evidence that you might see in urban areas um, and so looking at these indicators and looking, going deeper into the stories um, starts to paint the picture for each of these communities. And it's really great to hear 
each of you and how you've used the data, how you've used that evidence to inform actions, and then all the collaborative work that's happening at a at a you know at, at the community level. So um, we have some time for questions now. So I will um, pass it on to Natasha, who I think is going to facilitate it. Hi there, yeah, thank you everyone. Uh, Nadine, you did a great job of summarizing some of what we heard, so um, I'll leave that for now, but um, we did have, I wanted to start with um, one question that we had submitted in advance of the of the webinar, um, and I passed this around to everyone earlier, so jump in and let me know um, if you have a thought about this. Um, this person was asking, would you be able to share any ideas for small communities to engage different levels of government uh, to ensure the progress of the local poverty reduction work. Um, and, and so Anna, Jill, Carrie, Jan, you all work with uh, local poverty reduction efforts. Did anyone had an, have any ideas about this? Well, I, I'll speak to it. I think the most obvious um, areas of opportunity is certainly in housing. Um, we definitely need senior levels of government involved there and also in addressing that whole area of, of income um, and getting into fair wage, living wage, however it is you want to, to look at it and the, um, the kind of tra tax transfers or supports that are available to families that can, can make um, you know, living wage income a possibility. So I think those are two immediate ones that, that um, jump out. The other one, which is the hardest one to argue for, is that on the ground facilitation because it's all very well to look at data it's all very well to say this is what needs to be done but if there isn't some glue pulling together the various silos um, we tend to spin in our individual silos and that's probably the hardest level to convince senior levels of government to say that's a worthwhile investment well said Jan I, I oh sorry Anna no do you go ahead I, I can go ahead <laughs> to add briefly that in my experience working with municipalities around the Kootenays, planners and other local government staff often have a very clear picture of what's going on and what tools they have. I find that it's really impactful to work more with elected officials and try to build relationships with them and um, share your information with them so that you can um, hopefully influence them. They, they are the decision makers in the end. Yes, um, I would agree with that. And also, uh, I guess, as somebody who is an elected person in local government, it's um, really it, data is really helpful. Also, these multi-sectoral, um, you know, kind of collective impacty um, groups are also reassuring for political people to see that multiple sectors are coming together with shared interests. It feels. Um, uh, like a more secure thing to run with if I'm going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, just sort of be a little Machiavellian for a moment um, uh, and a political opportunist. I think also uh, there's a, a really important piece around keeping in touch with um, with people at all levels of government. And, and I mean, it's one thing to elect people who have the heart to do what you hope um, they may do around affecting the change you want to see, but it's it, it's another thing to empower them by letting them know what you think is going well and what and what needs to happen. I, you know, was just speaking with somebody who uh, was lobbying federal ministers in Ottawa last week um, at, around climate change, and she had she spoke to 50 different MPs, and they routinely get 15 letters um, sent to them about issues of broad public concern that are really important. And so you look at these. 15 letters from a nation of you know 30 whatever million people and think I guess the public has spoken you know like um, so we're, we're contacted less than you think uh, about things that are really important so I think there's there's something there to be said also about keeping in touch like Carrie was saying developing those relationships um, taking your local government people or um, uh, uh, provincial people out for tea and explaining what's going on, but also um, demonstrating that you're working with other people in other sectors uh, to make things happen. All of that is um, pretty irresistible, I would say. Well, and and I'd just like to follow up with that on, on dem demonstrating the linkages between the sectors. Mm -hmm. You know, for yes. example, how uh, a lack of affordable housing 
impacts the labor market. You know, how a lack of affordable food, well, you know, I mean, impacts the, uh, uh, and, and that's why we did our cost of living analysis was just to say, this is the actual cost of living in our community and how is this impacting our ability to recruit people to live in our community and the ability of people to live and work and make ends meet in our community. Yeah, Jill, when you said what would happen um, if those third, that the 30 percent of people you're talking about living in poverty had disposable income, I mean that's something that should make yeah. Any business person or economic development person's uh, hamsters start running, you know. Um, so, like, those are really great linkages for sure. And just to just to your point, Anna, and I think Jill, uh, what you were saying about, uh, you know, like show that this is an issue within the community that you're working with other people. One of the the conversations that we've had um, with the living wage group, and some of you are part of that, is that um, often the municipality does not want to get ahead of its constituents. And so demonstrating that employers are also on board and getting a kind of like a, a mass of employers to speak out about, you know, like we want to pay a living wage and here's why, and going to the municipality, sometimes that can help get the ball rolling with the municipality as well. Um, I want to move on because I see a couple more questions coming through the questions box and we don't have uh, too much time left. Um, but one of our questions was, and I, Jill, I think this was more directed towards you, but anyone, um, by all means you can answer, um, as our region prepares to launch a regional economic development strategy program, I'm wondering what would be the best way to frame poverty issues as part of this economic development work? Do you have any thoughts to add about that? Well, I think that part of economic development is the sharing of wealth, right, or the sharing of resources. And when we did our uh, forum on the economics of poverty reduction, we did kind of frame the conversation and we, we had our living wage researchers there doing a presentation. But for me, the living wage and cost of living analysis is, is, to, is not to put pressure on employers, but to say, this is impacting our, you know, how can employers not contribute to poverty? Um, and how can employers, uh, what, there's a variety of strategies that employers can use to share wealth with their employees, um, particularly in those vulnerable sectors like retail and hospitality that may have a, a challenge paying a living wage, um, and small business in particular. So, you know, you can, you can, um, you know, talk about uh, the distribution of economic vitality in, like, it's almost like a, a distribution of economic vitality as opposed to uh, economic development just unto itself. And I think that if you do tie things like housing, how does housing impact economic development? How does um, a lack of social inclusion impact economic development? I think perhaps if you can uh, frame it and, and as we said before, make those linkages, it's, it, it makes the conversation more impactful, I think. One of the things that's been encouraging to me is that our Economic Development Commission is just about to launch into a major strategic planning process in, in uh, January. And they have asked that we come and present our poverty data to them um, because they want to use that as part of their planning process, which tells me they're really paying attention to the degree to which poverty pulls down the vitality of a community and, and its economic hope as opposed to something to ignore and disappear. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, like I come back to that, it's, it's poverty reduction as an economic development opportunity. Yes. Kind of frames yeah. it in that positive, uh, you know, light, right? Right. And I'm just I'm just seeing a couple more questions coming through. I wanted to kind of get back to some of the, the discussion about um, data and measurement and indicators. And so uh, we've had a question, um, and we only have a couple of minutes left, but are you able to um, share some of your work on um, your data analysis, like the cost of living analysis? It would be nice to know how you determine the variables and prove the relevance on this data point. 
Well, a cost of living analysis really is a li living wage analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it is, you know, uh, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives has, has done this uh, really detailed uh, groundwork that I think it's good, it's very good to use that because it's, um, it, you know, it creates kind of a, a common measurement across the entire country that you can make locally relevant. And we're fortunate in BC that we can take Vancouver's annual um, measurement and, and then adapt it for different um, cities throughout the province. But, you know, I think to use that constant measurement is a good one. When we did it the first time, we sat down and we tried to decide what a family of four would need. But that work has been done um, by very qualified institutions. Yeah, yeah, the NBC, I know you do have, there is um, like the CCPA and the Living Wage for Families, they are kind of a united uh, central network that is working to, to help other communities present um, some of that standard data on the cost of living, which is fantastic. Um, yeah. I'm looking at the time and I'm seeing um, lots of different questions um, here. I'll just share uh, the living wage analysis that Nadine has sent with everybody. Okay. Uh, but I think I think we do have to I think we do have to wrap it up. Um, and thank you so much um, to all of you for sharing your stories, uh, for sharing about uh, the learning and the sharing that's going on with the Rural Development Institute, um, and all about how you're turning. Uh, measurement and evaluation and really using it for learning, um, reflection, and then action um, in your poverty reduction strategies. I think those are some really useful lessons. Um, there are just a couple of closing announcements that I wanted to go over. I wanted to ask everybody to stay in touch with us uh, with Vibrant Communities, Cities Reducing Poverty. Um, you are able to receive the latest thinking news, tools, and resources from around the Poverty Reduction Network, including um, these, these four initiatives in the rural Development Institute by subscribing uh, to that newsletter or visiting the online learning community for poverty reduction practitioners at www.vibrantcanada.ca. Um, and if you enjoyed this webinar and have a particular interest in evaluating a program, a project, or a collaborative um, and have some evaluation experience but are looking to build your skills um, and more intentionally tackle uh, the critical challenge of getting and acting on feedback, you can join us for this three day in-person evaluating community impact workshop in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Um, that's coming up November 14th to 16th, so you'll learn about um, frameworks for communicating progress, capturing outcomes, considering contribution rather than attribution, um, and lots more. So the registration link is at the bottom of the screen, and we'll send that to you in the follow-up. Um, and then finally, in a few days, you'll receive the follow-up email, which will include a link to the recording of today's call, as well as the PowerPoint slides um, and some follow-up resources that we've mentioned. Uh, you can email me at natasha at tamarackcommunity.ca to provide your feedback about today's webinar, because we're always trying to improve on the experience. Um, so thank you again, um, everybody, for submitting your questions, for sharing your, uh, for sharing your stories. Um, we hope to learn with you again soon. Take thank care. You. Have a great afternoon.